So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make some feta today, and then afterwards we're going to use the leftover whey to make ricotta salata. So we're gonna make the easiest cheese that you can make that uses rennet, and then we're gonna make the easiest cheese that you can use, that, that you can make starting today with what you have in your kitchen, just with some milk, some heat, and a little bit of citric acid or vinegar. So stay tuned. Uh, we're gonna get started by sanitizing all of our equipment. We're gonna just throw it in the bottom of my double boiler pot here. Can heat it up in the water. I'm gonna boil this for about 10 minutes and sanitize it. All the plastic components that I use, I'm actually going to sanitize with a little bit of vinegar, uh, kill any molds that are on there. And then we're gonna go ahead and get started on this process. So stay tuned and we're gonna show you how to do this and save a little bit of money as well. Thanks. So slight change of plans. Uh, the induction burner I was going to use so that we had our nice backdrop <laughs> has a fan in it and would create a lot of noise for shooting a video with. So we're not going to do that. Uh, but just to give you an idea too here, guy, this is the sterilization process. I forgot to mention, make sure you sterilize your cheesecloths. Uh, we use cheesecloth. Honestly, we use basic run-of-the-mill um, cheesecloth you can get from the dollar store. Okay, gang, we're about to start heating up our milk. Um, you notice I have lots of milk options here uh, well milk actually was on sale the day uh, so i actually bought some milk couldn't get to using it to make cheese right away so these two have been in the freezer for about a week to 10 days and it's no problem at all making cheese at least in my experience so far uh, with frozen milk once it's been thawed out so we're going to go ahead and put this in I'd like to say as well that, listen, my experience with cheese so far is, I pretty much call every cheese I make a certain style. So this is, let's just say Tony's feta style cheese because for some reason my recipes never turn out exactly the way they're supposed to, but we like them, they work, they taste great. Um, I am not a cheese expert by any means. I'm gonna give you the names of people that are, but this has worked out well for us and something I think anyone can pull off and do. As long as you don't get too wound up in the details and getting things precisely correct uh, for a specific cheese that you wanna make. So I have here, we got about six liters, a jug and a half. So we're gonna base our recipe on that six liters. So into the double boiler. we go we're gonna get that heat up a little bit I see I've got some milk fat milk solids down in the bottom of this jug so I'm just gonna carefully add a little bit of milk into this jug and we're just gonna give it a shake those suspended milk fats into the milk again and there we go that's a lot better pretty good now it's real important that you sanitize your pots everything needs to be clean be right back and that you don't when you're making um, a, a cheese that uses a rennet you don't put it directly on the burner of your stove use a double boiler of some kind this is just the bottom of a steamer pot that I actually found uh, someone was getting rid of it uh, we use it to do steam canning with uh, and a bunch of things. It happens to fit my large stock pot perfectly. So uh, I'm going to talk more about heat management because that's actually my biggest challenge. We've got the burner on. I had this water boiling. So I'm going to bring it up to about a medium, just below medium heat. This is the part that takes the time, waiting for your milk to get up to temperature. And you want to start with, with this 
particular recipe, you want to get your milk to 37 degrees Celsius. So right now, with my handy dandy little thermometer, pretty warm already. We're at 20 degrees because I've had this 21. I had this sitting out overnight um, and put it in a water bath to actually thaw it out. So we only have about 16 degrees to go. Uh, but that is the part that seems to take the longest, is getting it up to temperature. So we're just going to give it a little stir. Slotted stainless steel spoon works great. And I'll show you, there is a cheese maker stir, which sounds kind of crazy, but it does work better. You're stirring from the bottom of the pot up to the top of the milk. Trying not to introduce too much air into the milk while you're doing it. I'll bring you in closer here in a sec. So we're going to pause the video. I'm going to bring you back once we get up to 37 degrees, and then we're going to start adding our cultures. All right, gang, this is the cheese maker stir. You go from the bottom of your milk up to the top. All right, folks, we're starting to get close to temperature. Um, I'm using a recipe from a wonderful lady in New Zealand uh, that was actually given to me by who I consider to be my cheese mentor. Um, Cheeseneeds.com. Cheeseneeds.com. Find them on Facebook. Find them they're on the web, cheeseneeds.com. But also, they have a wonderful Facebook group called Learn to Make Cheese. Um, and she has a little store attached to that group. She's been an absolute wealth of knowledge for us. I probably would have given up because I was following a recipe from YouTube. So, note just because you see it here doesn't mean it'll work for you. This is using Canadian. Uh, three and a half percent or three and a quarter percent homogenized milk it's pasteurized and so our milk is different than it is in Europe or Australia or New Zealand or other parts of the world <clears throat> so you want to figure that out for yourself a little bit uh, but because our milk is homogenized I'm actually going to add some calcium chloride and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take them a sneak over here We're going to add a quarter of a teaspoon of calcium chloride that I got from cheesenews.com. Not sponsored, by the way, they're just good people. <clears throat> so, quarter teaspoon diluted in a quarter cup of non chlorinated water. We're on a well, so we are non chlorinated water. We're going to dump that in. And you can do that right at the very beginning when you start heating your milk, it's fine. It adds a little bit of calcium into the milk again, so that it will create better curds and uh, just give you a better result. So we've been coming up the temperature pretty quick here. Let me just check that with you. Stir that in real good. Let's see what we got. So we're over 37 degrees already. This is part of the tricky part of temperature control. So I'm actually going to turn my burner off right now because I'm going to go up above 37 with the heat that's in this water. So I'm going to lift the top pot off the double boiler for a few moments. Let some of that steam kind of come on out of there. And that should hopefully help us cool this down just a little bit and since we're at temperature I'm gonna go ahead we're gonna start adding our uh, cultures so this is for a feta uh, and this particular recipe uh, calls for a pinch of mesophile culture and I probably said that wrong if you're a cheese nerd or there's a wonderful YouTube channel, uh, Gavin Weber's YouTube channel, and he calls all of his fans curd nerds. I love it. My wife loves to say the words with the Aussie accent. It's awesome. But <clears throat> if you're a curd nerd, correct me on how to pronounce that and let me know in the comments. So we're going to add a pinch or an eighth of a teaspoon of mesophile culture and same with thermophile culture. So check your recipes. I'll put the details in the comments below, in the description below. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. And this stuff does tend to set up a little bit hard. It's time for some new stuff for me. 
the mesophile anyway does. We're going to go ahead and add that in to our milk. And then we're going to let that dissolve and start to bloom at the temperature. The same thing with the thermophile culture. Sprinkle it over top of your milk. Time for some new cultures. I'm gonna to have to order some more from cheesenees.com because they're a little clunky, a little clumpy, but a little bit of stirring action and they will dissolve and bloom. And then the other thing we're gonna add right now, the Gibbs Feta, Parmigiano, any of those style cheeses, their kind of sharp bite is lipase. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and add some of that now. We tend to like a quite a bit of bite in ours. So we're actually going to, I'm actually gonna add a little bit more than what it calls for. It says a pinch or an eighth of a teaspoon. I'm gonna go with a full quarter teaspoon. A um, little bit of a heaping teaspoon there, quarter teaspoon, and sprinkle that in. We tend to eat the cheese so fast, it doesn't really get a chance to get to be too strong. If you were to age this for several months, it might end up being a little bit too strong for you. So experiment, as Vanessa says, cook with emotion, follow a recipe when it comes to cheese making, but then after you've done it a few times, go ahead and make it your own and try. What's the worst that can happen? You're, it doesn't turn out quite as good as you thought. I haven't had, other than a, a curd not setting, I haven't had a cheese completely fail where it was terrible or inedible or taste bad. Um, it might have been softer than it should have. It might have been harder than it should have. But I've never had one that actually failed where we're like, oh, that's, that's terrible. So that's the cultures. We're going to go ahead and let those mature now and, uh, and sit and rest for, let me check my recipe. 30 minutes on this recipe to let them kind of mature and I'll be watching my temperature and trying to keep that cool uh, So we're gonna let that sit for 30 minutes and then we're gonna come back All right, we've been 30 minutes of the cultures uh, blooming and maturing um, My temperature was up pretty high Again, that's one of the things I struggle with the most if you're an experienced cheese maker and watching this you're probably cringing right now but drop some tips in the comments on how I can control that. So I got up to about 40 degrees roughly, which is two, three degrees higher than it should have been. So took it off, put it on the counter to let the uh, cultures mature. And it's been a half an hour now, and we are at, we're still at 37 degrees, which is the target for the recipe. So we'll leave it there. So now what we do, a few minutes ago I took some calf rennet, which I put away, <laughs> a liquid rennet, and took a quarter teaspoon and uh, mixed it into a quarter cup of uh, non-chlorinated water. We're on well water, so that's what I used. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the rennet, add that in, and this is important, we're gonna gently stir for no more then one minute. I typically do a count to 45 and and then cover it up. All right. Now we're going to throw a lid back on this. It should stay at our target temperature with lid on no problem at all. Uh, and we're going to let this sit for at least an hour. Well, all right, folks, it's been an hour. We're just going to check these curds for a clean break here. I suspect we're going to need to go a little bit longer, but basically what we're going to do, let me see if this is going to be in camera. Yeah, okay. So we're going to take a clean knife, then sterilize, sterilize. We're going to run it into the curd. We're going to turn it sideways after we cut it and lift. No. Looks a little bit like poached eggs or scrambled eggs. Um, that is not a very hard set yet. So we're gonna come back to this in about oh, 20 minutes or so. 
All right, gang, well, it's been another oh, 20 minutes since we last checked for a clean break. Let's have a look at it now. That's a lot better break. Curds are still a little soft. I seem to struggle with getting good curds, but I seem to be able to make cheese that we like, so we're gonna go with it. So the next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna cut the curd and we're gonna cut it into about half inch squares. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a nice clean knife. Down. And cut. Okay, there's the cubes. Now I gotta cut the diagonals. Try to cut those columns. So I'm just gonna take the knife, go in at an angle, luckily with making a feta, as my cheese mentor says, it's the most forgiving cheese to make. Maybe that's why I like to make it so much. curds heal for all well, about five minutes or so just to let them get a little bit firmer put the lid back on okay we've been five minutes to let our curd heal and let's see how that looks in the camera there oh, it's not too bad i'm gonna zoom in just a little bit so the important part of stirring your curd, this recipe calls for a gentle stir three times over the course of an hour and a half. So um, the more you stir it and the longer you cook the cheese, the drier your feta is gonna be. So if you want a drier feta, stir it a little bit more, cook a little bit longer. If you want a moister feta, a little shorter. I typically go a little longer and stir a little bit more because we like a little drier feta. Now, again, I always struggle to get good, really firm curds, and maybe somebody can help me out with that. But so the key thing is the first stir is super gentle. I'm just going to move them around a little bit. Just move the spoon ever so gently through the curds so that they can kind of knit up again after this stir. Inevitably, I feel like I have broken curds. Um, however, I mean, people love the feta that we make. We have a lot of people that really enjoy it when they come to the house or we give it to them. And we like it, which is the stuff that really matters. So I used to get pretty angsty about a broken curd. I don't really anymore. I just go with it because it seems to turn out at the end. And that's really what matters. Anytime I see any large, really large curds, I just hit them with the edge of my spoon to break them up a little bit more. And like I said, I've got kind of that scrambled egg look, which is not really what you want. But hopefully you'll take a little consolation from the fact that it doesn't have to be perfect. And you can still make a product that you enjoy. So I'm just real gently lifting the curd and letting it fall back down again. Without really running my spoon through it. Stirring might not be the right word. It's more like a move the curd around. You want the curd to release the whey as much as it can so you end up with a drier, harder cheese. That may not be the right description, but it should get the intent across. And 
and we're going to call it there. And now we're going to let it sit for half an hour. All right, gang, back for stir number two. And I don't know if you can see this, but the curd mass has fallen to the bottom of the way. And so it's, you'll notice there's a lot more of that golden yellow way on top. So it is expelling a bunch of whey, which means what's left behind is what we're gonna use to make our cheese. So I'm just gonna give it a little bit more stir here. Break that up. They find the large chunks. We're gonna give them a little bit of a stabby stab and break those up. And just real carefully give it some gentle stirring. We want to just encourage that way to come out of those curds. The more whey stays in the pot, the less drains out, and the drier and firmer the cheese will be. Big chunk right there. All right. We're going to call that good. I'm just going to check the temperature of that curds and whey. Just a hair under 37 right now, 35. So I'm probably going to fire back up the double boiler for the next batch and uh, warm that liquid back up again. So we'll see you back here in another half an hour for another stir. All right, so last stir. Been an hour and a half since uh, we cut the curd and did the first stir. I'll probably just stir these a little bit longer for this one before we go ahead and strain them out. We're going to stop the video now, and we're going to go ahead and get ready to strain these. So, All right. We're just going to go ahead and uh, strain these through, and hope you're going to be able to see it. I have... You're not going to be able to see that. Let's try this. I've got a cheese form in there, uh, which I bought from cheeseneeds.com, uh, and I've got my cheesecloth inside that form. And then and that's sitting inside of a colander, inside of a big stock pot, because we want to catch this... Uh, whey. We're going to make ricotta from the whey and even then we want to keep that whey. It is fantastic for bread, buns, uh, it makes pasta amazing. So we're going to go ahead and strain this out and hopefully we can get it all to fit in the form. This isn't always the case.
don't think it's all gonna go. We're gonna bring you back in a couple minutes here while I figure out if I'm gonna be able to fit this all in here, if I'm gonna need to get another form. Stay with me, I'll be right back. Okay, gang, I was able to fit that in there. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. <laughs> it took some squishing and it's over the top, but once I uh, fold the cheesecloth over, that all smoothed out put the follower on top I'm gonna to just gently with hand pressure kind of smoosh that that's the technical term smoosh that down so it starts to kind of flatten out a little bit you do have to put some pressure now a lot of people make feta where they just let it sit in the baskets or they'll stack two baskets on top of each other and that is enough pressure to uh, press the feta cheese it's not a heavily pressed cheese we like it a little bit firmer than that again tony's feta style cheese it's not probably a traditional feta but i imagine just about every farmer that made their own feta had their own way to do it as many farmers as there were there probably was that many variations so i like to think i'm just being a rebel and following traditions of independence. <laughs> All right, so next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, I have my homemade cheese press here. I'm just gonna take this pot that has all the whey in it. I'm gonna move that over here. And then I'm gonna put the press down in the sink because we're so good. We're gonna spell quite a bit of whey out of that or in the next little bit here, so stay with me. So this is my homemade cheese press. It is just uh, some ready rod, some scrap wood, some cut up cutting boards, some uh, threaded press in nuts, an old cutting board with holes drilled through it. And that's all it is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this form out. I'm gonna put that down in the bottom here. Let's see how that looks. If you guys can see that or not. Well, not really. Let's zoom back out again. Oh, wrong way. All right, zoom back out. There we go. We are not professional videographers here. So we're gonna put that on there like that. Then I have a spring for this, which is gonna fit underneath here. Just gonna thread this down. It only needs a couple of pounds of pressure for feta to press. It's not a heavy press cheese like a cheddar or something like that. But I do need to get it to go inside this form. So I'm going to just put a little heavier pressure on it here. Give it a little heavier press to set and knit the curds up. The curds all knit up. So we're going to let that sit for oh, about 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to flip this over. Okay, hey gang, it's been over 10 minutes. Um, we're gonna go ahead and loosen this spring off and we're gonna take the cheese out of the, out of the form and turn it over and then replace it back in the form so we can get some more whey out of that. does give off a lot of way. All right, so hopefully you can see that. We're gonna take the cheesecloth. Pull it to the edge. And we're gonna carefully, whoops, we don't wanna do that. We want that back in there. Carefully pull that. Out. It's knitted up really nice. I think that sounded like snit. It's knitted. The curds have knitted up very nicely. 
Vanessa, yeah. could you get me the big knife, please? So we've got a lip like this. Um, you can see how squishy and spongy it is. I want to cut that off with a sharp knife. Uh, thank you. Not that my knives are really sharp, but I'm going to cut that off because it will create spots for mold to grow. So we're just going to carefully slice that off all the way around. That probably sounded great on camera, sorry gang. And I'm just gonna flip that over. And we're gonna replace it back in the follower. I'm gonna tighten the spring up a bit. We don't wanna put a ton of pressure on it. cloth back on top push it back into the form nice and firmly now we're gonna let this press overnight in the sink and the thing about a spring form it's a little bit trickier than a straight weighted form a weighted form has constant pressure of course but with the spring as it expels way the spring's going to loosen up so I'm going to make it way too tight to start with because as it expels that way the pressure is going to loosen up so I'm just going to pull that down this is just kind of by feel and practice I'm going to compress that spring about an inch or so that's probably about 10 pounds which is way too much but by the time tomorrow morning comes along, it'll only be a couple pounds. So that's feta cheese in the press till tomorrow. Tomorrow we're gonna take it out, we're gonna salt it, and we're gonna start to let it dry. Yeah. All right, gang. So our cheese, our feta, has been sitting overnight in the press, uh, in the sink, because it does give off a lot of weight uh, still. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through the salting process. Um, there's lots of different ways to do feta. You can do it in a brine, which we've done, and it works. Um, there's an excellent video on Gavin Weber's channel on how to make a saturated brine. Um, I mean, he's the cheese man, definitely. Just search Gavin Weber's search saturated brine, and uh, he's got a great resource there for you. Um, we don't do that personally. Uh, we prefer to uh, just take the cheese out, salt it on the counter for two to three days, let it build a rind. We're going to salt it a couple times a day. Um, and then we cube it up and we put it into oil, which is the way we love it the most. Thanks to Chara at uh, cheesies.com for that one. <clears throat> so, been sitting overnight in the press. I did tighten it up a little bit more this morning, so just so it had uh, some steady pressure when we got up. Take it out of here and then we're going to weigh it too just so we can show you how much cheese we got out of that six liters of milk roughly okay i'm just going to put this in the sink <coughs> bless you <laughs> listen gang we are not professional youtubers so life happens around us You'll hear our dogs bark in our videos. You're going to hear our roosters crowing in the background. You might catch glimpses of our dog, <clears throat> our senior dog, walking around. She really don't care about you at all. She's 18. She's going to walk over top of our cables from time to time, knock over our lighting. This is just life, and we're just sharing it with you, so we're not professional, and nor are we probably ever going to be. Anyway, here's this massive, great big block of feta cheese. And it's got quite a bit of whey in it still. So it's pretty moist. It's pretty spongy. Um, 
it's not a perfectly square block because, well, nothing in my life is perfectly square. Just look at anything I build in any of my other videos. But uh, it is going to be delicious. We're going to enjoy it. And we're going to show you how we salt it and go from there. So what we're going to do first is just out of curiosity's sake, we're going to weigh this and see how many grams we have. I'll do it in pounds too for our uh, American watchers. But Vanessa, could you write this down? 851 grams of feta cheese, which is one pound, 14 ounces. That's almost a pound and a half. Is that how the ounces work? I don't even know. If you're, if you're a US watcher, let me know how, what that actually works out to. One pound, 14 ounces. Um, drop that in the comments. So that's our nice, great big block of feta cheese. That came out of probably in Canada right now, that's, uh, let's see, like four, what are they, four ninety nine for a gallon of milk right now, Vanessa? I think. Four ninety nine. Five ninety nine right now. Yeah. So six bucks plus half of that, so that's nine dollars worth of milk. Um, if you live in a place that the milk is cheaper, well, then it's definitely going to be better value. But I promise you, if you went into the store and wanted to buy uh, eight hundred and fifty grams of feta, you'd pay more than that. So. To start the air drying process, pretty simple. Sushi mat, airflow. We want to let this dry a little bit. So all we're going to do is put that on our sushi mat. We're going to take some non-iodized salt. I'm just going to wash. Uh, we use a fairly coarse salt usually. Uh, you can buy cheese salt. I don't know why you ever would. Uh, because cheese salt is just non-iodized salt with a fancy name on it and maybe a different texture size so that seems like a waste to me i'm just going to take some uh, coarse kosher salt and we're just going to sprinkle that on top and then just rub it in and we're going to do that on all the sides of this big boy the salt's going to salt the cheese so we're going to actually add the flavor to it uh, but it's also going to uh, pull more whey out of the block. It's amazing how much whey will come out of this still, even though it's been pressing. Um, so the longer you let it sit, the longer, the more you salt it, it's A, going to be obviously saltier, but B, it's also going to pull more whey out. It's going to be a drier cheese. So try it, make it once, decide if you like it that way, if you want it moister, um, stop salting it sooner. If you want it drier, salt it longer. Like my wife says, cook with emotion. And she means develop your powers of taste. If you don't like something, change it. Taste it and change it. Okay, one more side. Another way that we have done this, and it works great as well we may actually do this both ways along the journey is we'll let this sit for a day like this and then we'll cube it and put it into a bowl uh, with a, a little draining pad underneath the bowl so that the way can get doesn't, the cheese and sit in the way and cube it up and put salt in it which is going to dry the cubes out faster and more uniformly um, we like it both ways i think i don't think there's any way we prefer it right now so Typically, we'll just do it this way. We might do it both ways just to show you the uh, in, in the next segment of the video. <clears throat> so that's it. This is going to sit for um, about three days on the counter. If you're in a, an area that has some flies um, or at that time of year, uh, a little net on top just to keep the flies and stuff off of it is a good idea. But you want the air to flow around it. You want a place for the way to drain. Um, I'll probably check in with you on to show you what it looks like tomorrow morning. Uh, you'll be surprised at how much weight comes out of it. So that's our feta cheese. The next step is going to be uh, putting it into uh, olive oil is our preference, or actually not olive oil, sorry, uh, a light canola oil, canola oil, words are good. A light canola oil or a light vegetable oil, something that doesn't have a lot of flavor. Hey everybody, today is day two for our feta. Uh, I trimmed off some of the high edges on it, but I wanted to show you kind of what it looks like underneath here. 
can see how much moisture is coming off that cheese. So we're gonna turn it over and we're gonna flip it every day for a couple of days here. And uh, I'm gonna re-salt the outside uh, just by doing what I did before, rub a little salt on the outside, flip it a couple times, and then in a couple days, we're going to cut it up. Hey gang. Okay, so we are on day three for the feta cheese. And uh, I'm gonna cut this up into cubes right now. We salted it two days in a row, turned it over a couple of times, and it's remarkable how much water comes out. Now it's firmed up quite a bit, but it's still soft in the middle. So I'm gonna cube this, put it into this bowl, and then salt it overnight. Then tomorrow, I'm gonna come back. Uh, anyhow, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this up for you today here, folks. And what I'm gonna do to cut it, uh, because it is a little crumbly, I don't really want it to crumble right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it off this um, sushi mat. And if you, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Whoa. Well, you probably saw that whey spill out onto the counter. This is real. <laughs> you probably saw the whey spill out on the counter. It stayed on the cutting board, Vanessa. She got really panicked because whey is really sticky and hard to clean up. I'm gonna clean that up real quick. So I'm gonna take, uh, to cut this, because it's a big block of cheese. I don't have a cheese, a wire cheese cutter big enough. I'm just gonna take a piece of stainless steel wire that you would use for picture hanging and like a piece of dental floss, coil it around my fingers and then run this through the cheese. And that lets me get a nice cube without having to worry about it um, breaking off like it would if I was doing this with a knife. A knife would break that into, into chunks. So we're going to do this again. Glad we're going to let this dry overnight with some salt. That'll pull the whey out a little bit more. You want to taste a piece, Vanessa? Hang on. <laughs> Thank you. Best part of cooking. Tasting what you make. Mm, that is good. Mmm. Mmm. This is drier. This jar, that's mm. really great. It's going to be so good in the oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's got, if you remember from the beginning of the video, yeah, I'm eating on camera. One of the ingredients we added was lipase. And that gives it that sharpness, like the goat milk flavor. That doesn't start to become pronounced until about the third day and beyond. As it matures and ripens, I should start cutting instead of just talking. Um, that light paste flavor is going to come through even stronger and it's going to sharpen that up even more, which is really what we like. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Not, that's not really that salty good. though. Mm -hmm. So another night in the salt will be great. Mm -hmm. That's really good though. So we're just going to cube that up into one inch chunks. they did they started doing it and they tasted it and then they changed it and then it became their recipe and they passed that down to their family for generations salt I love our new kitchen design if you there may be somewhere on the channel an old video that shows me doing some probably some mushroom work in our old kitchen a galley kitchen there was a wall right here this is so much better. And we're gonna have a door. Yes, this is, I can't wait to show you. There's gonna be a door going in here, a full glass door. It's kind of got drywall renovation marks in it, but it's, uh, it's sitting in our cabin and it will be done soon. So all I'm gonna do is take non-iodized, fairly coarse salt, sprinkle a tablespoon, maybe two on this. And then I'm gonna toss that around and try, make sure that I try to get every surface of every cube 
in contact with the salt. See, there's a sneaky one, right? There's actually two pieces in there. Make sure you break them up because you want that surface area for the salt to do its magic, pull the moisture out, it'll pull the way out. We're gonna put this in overnight. I'm just gonna leave it on the counter just like this. And then tomorrow, right about the same time, we're going to um, take this out of here, spoon it out so we don't get any away with it, into the oil and the rosemary. All right, folks, we're on day four now. And uh, in the last little video, I cubed up the feta and salted it again. It has definitely dried out. It's been about 24 hours since I did the last process. You might notice there's a little less cheese in the bowl. If you compare, go back a little bit. It's really good. So all we're gonna do to preserve this is put this in some oil. Now, I will say this, uh, preserving things in oil, which basically keeps things from getting in contact with oxygen, has been used for hundreds of years as a preservative method for um, tomatoes and, I mean, all sorts of things, cheese, meats, you name it. It is generally speaking, according to the various government agencies, not an approved or accredited method to preserve food today. So you will have to follow your own judgment on that. Um, we do it. I'm not saying you should do it. Uh, we preserve our tomatoes this way as well, a lot of them, uh, and, the, and cheese like this. So you have to follow your own instincts do a little research on your own educate yourself and decide what you want to do but this is what we do and this is going to fill this jar just about right up actually maybe enough that i can sneak a piece or two vanessa's outside right now watering the flowers so she won't know unless she can hear me so i'm just going to pour that put that in there and these two pieces are for me aha hmm so good all right a little shape to settle it in now hopefully you can see that all right there's um rosemary in the jar and then all i'm going to do is top it off with a neutral flavored meaning canola oil or vegetable oil canola oil is great mm, good cheese give a little jiggle get the little air bubbles to come out Air bubbles and moisture are not what you want. And there is our feta cheese, preserved. And this will last probably, actually, probably six months in the fridge. Hope you can see that. I don't want to tip it too much. This jar does not seal real tight. Doesn't have to, because it, the oil's doing the work, not the seal. So that's the feta. We're gonna nibble on that for six months probably. Actually, it'll never last that long here. We use it in all kinds of things. And don't throw the oil out. Use the oil as you deplete the cheese. Use the oil for salads, uh, dressings, cooking. It's got a it's got a real feta cheesy flavor to it, so it adds a lot of spunk to dishes. So uh, there's the feta video. Hope you give it a try. Please remember to shoot us a like, a thumbs up, a subscribe, bing that bell, bing the bell. Well, ring that bell, ring that bell. It really helps our channel, lets us know you're actually watching. So uh, appreciate you, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye now.